So today we're gonna to do the sampling practice exam. And this is just to kind of go over this stuff again. Well, actually, because one of the things, actually one of the things that kind of triggered this was I me mean, looking at that was uh, the, uh, it's been a while since we did the um, uh, classical sampling stuff. So we'll do a sampling practice exam and I'll send out the sampling uh, exam. It'll do Friday 4-8. Yeah, a week from this Friday. And then we'll start the chapter 11 handout. I don't think we're gonna finish that, but we'll start out with the, uh, that is the wrong group. This is the right group. Okay, so this is gonna be some, something getting similar to this. And part of the reason why you do the practice exam is, uh, well, first of all, to review the stuff, but also there, there's really two ways to get stuff into long-term memory. And one is through a traumatic event, which is like, you know, if you're, so if, you're, if your grandmother dies or something, uh, you always remember where you were at, that kind of thing. Even though normally you wouldn't know where, you know, it, it wouldn't, you wouldn't register where it was, but you know, we can't really do teaching. But uh, repetition is the next best thing. So that's why we do, we do this more than once throughout a quarter or a semester. Okay, so this one is, uh, uh, do you guys have this one? Yeah, I got it today. Yeah, you emailed it. Okay, good. All right, so this is uh, just going to go through. We're going to do the test of controls, classical sampling, which, <laughs> sorry, and um, then the monetary unit sampling stuff. That's it, all right? Yeah. So there's going to be uh, uh, four things. You could do uh, a problem on on attribute sampling, a problem on classical sampling, and then two on the monetary unit sampling. Okay, so this first one is similar to what we did uh, last class. Uh, the editor allows for an error rate of 6% of the excess level of control risk. The allowance for sampling risk is 3%. And the following are taken. Uh, what's the error rate of the tests? Anyone? So we took a sample of 315 were 5%. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah. So I did it wrong here. Okay, so 15, oops. So 5%. And can the controls be relied upon? No. No, good. Because the allowance for sampling risk is three. So in other words, it could be, it's, it's uh, 5%, it could be plus or minus three, depending on how they do work out the uh, calculations. But we're more worried about that it could be, you know, 5% plus three. So the error rate, Five percent. Okay. 
plus the allowance of 3%. And again, that's sort of uh, underneath that bell curve, what AGWA could go wrong. So the upper limit is uh, 8%. This would be no. And because the upper limit is greater than uh, the allowed uh, 6%, I don't know how to say this. So we're going to, they're only allowing for 6%. Okay. But, you know, and, and this is our best estimate. Our best estimate is 5%. Okay. But there might be an additional. Let me make this a different color. Okay, so the air rate is 5%. Well, we yeah, have this allowance. That means it could be off by a little bit more because this is a sample. And so the upper limit is that we could be off by as much as 8% uh, could be the actual, the, uh, actual air rate in the sample. And we're only allowing for six. So this is more than what we're allowing for. <laughs> Lazy arrows are probably more confusing than anything. But um, Okay, so here is a trick question. What is a misstatement of the purchases? You don't use the test of controls to find misstatements, right? Yeah, it's unknown. And you're exactly right. Um, It's unknown, and it it could it could be the you know the, the actual financial statements could be could be fine, you know, uh, just because the controls I mean are being followed or followed enough to for us to rely on them doesn't mean the financial statements are, are um, any problem. Okay, uh, how would the results of the test impact the plan substantive tests of 500 items? Okay, so we cannot accept this. We can't, we can't rely on these uh, controls. So we planned on using five, a test of 500 items. And now that we can't rely on them, what will that do to the substantive tests of 500 items? We, we need more or less? When we need more? Yep. Mm 
No, it, 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 you know, the judgment calls how many more you're going to need and at what level you're going to be at. But wait, 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 there should be a question right there. <laughs> um, you know, it could be a uh, Um, something more than 500 though, because you can't rely on it. Now, if you could rely on it, you would probably just stay with the 500 items. So if you, if you could rely on it, and it could be a judgment call too, that for instance, if you go through the thing and there's, that you don't find any errors, you may even reduce it. Um, you know, if it doesn't look like they have any errors in the, in the sample that you took, it may be that the controls can be relied upon even more. But generally speaking, if, if, if you can rely on the controls, you go with the planned amount of substantive testing. Those are done ahead of time. Um, question though. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're, uh, so you're, I understand that the uh, percentage uh, of 8% is higher than the upper limit of 6%. Right. I understand that we're diluting, we're going to dilute it by adding more items to it. Um, but if the error rate is, uh, is 8%, the allowance of 3% plus 5%, wouldn't you just uh, potentially have more errors as well? Well, we're we going to do so the, the substantive testing. These are going to be for the dollar amounts. Okay. Where am I at here? Um, let me get rid of um, yeah, so these are for the, uh, those are, these are the dollar amount tests. These are the dollar tests. And you're right though, the, um, the amount of errors in there probably would be, you know, a variable could be uh, up there. So these are our dollar tests. And these may or may not be misstated. Yeah, it's possible these are all right on. It's just, you know, um, you know, even though there's not a, a department manager signature on it, it might be that the purchase order was valid and we got the items in and uh, all that kind of stuff. So these guys, these gonna be dollar tests for uh, to see what uh, material misstatements. And you're gonna have to increase those though because you can't, um, uh, you can't rely on the controls. Uh, Tesla controls, are they required by the AICPA? No. They are, they are looking at you and not your screen, if that was your <laughs> I'm sorry. They are only uh, required No, they're only required if the auditor is relying on the internal controls. I don't think we talked about this, but I mean, I mean, you know, let's go ahead and throw it in here also. Okay, so well, let me mark this red. Uh, here's a This is kind of tangential to this. Uh, suppose you find a uh, let me change a little bit. The auditors of a non issuer. Find a material weakness in internal controls. So they find a weakness that is material. That it's a, it's a big weakness in internal controls. Uh, how is this reported? So. Notice that this is not a dollar amount. Wow. 
So uh, you find a weakness in internal controls. They, you know, let's say it's a let's say it's a jewelry store and they don't lock the door in. They leave the door wide open. Okay, a material weakness in internal controls. Now, the the jewelry may may or may not you know whatever's in the store may or may not be misstated, but there's this material weakness if they leave the door open. How does that get reported? If it's a financial audit, it does not go in the audit report. You don't want to tell everybody in the world that they leave the front door open. So if, if it's a material weakness, um, and by the way, you know, if, if it's a material misstatement, dollar amount, it does go in the audit report. If it's a material weakness in internal controls, those get reported to the audit committee or the board of directors and management to try to fix the, you know, let them know if it, that this is having to fix it. But the financial statements may not be misstated. And if they're not misstated, it does not go in the audit report. But it, it does get reported to either the audit committee, if they don't have an audit committee, then the board of directors. I should say management first. So you're going to tell management about it, but you're also going to tell the audit committee uh, or the board of directors if they don't have an audit committee. So you're going to report it all the way up, you know, the company chain if you do find a material weakness in internal controls. And again, just because there's a weakness in internal controls is not the same in the finance statements are misstated. They might be good. Now, if they are misstated, you know, then that's a different ballgame than it goes in the audit report. But if the if if the, you have this material weakness but nothing is misstated, uh, you report that to the board of directors. If it was an audit of internal controls, obviously that would go in the internal controls audit. But um, yeah, so. Uh, if, if you do find a, a material weakness in internal controls, it does not go to it does not go in the, in the audit report if it's a financial audit. Okay. Classical sampling. Uh, classical sampling is the uh, kind of the normal sampling we think about. Uh, it's and it's uh, good for. Overstatements or understatement. This is really good for everything. You know, it, it may not be the best for, for everything, but it, it's it's good for everything. Um, there's only a few situations where the monetary unit sample is is, uh, is better, but uh, for the most part, uh, classical sampling can be used in, in almost any situation. Okay, so first thing I do is calculate the average. Sample of a oops, and it take that many items. And so we got 50. So the auto value is 50, and the book value is. Okay, so yeah, you know, and, and this will be the same for um, you know whatever method you're using. You'll use these same numbers, but now we're going to try to project it out over the population as a whole. Oh. 
Okay, so uh, mean per unit, that's just the average. And so whose average are we gonna use? The audit average or the book average? Audit. Yeah, the audit average is the better, this is the better number, generally speaking, because it's one that we came up with. So, and we're saying uh, $50 each. So we're saying that we came up with $50 each and that everything that they have, the total number of accounts, um, 8,000 should all have be uh, at this $50 level. Uh, Four hundred thousand. Okay, so this will be our projected value. And what will be the um, projected misstatement? 20,000? 20,000. Yep. Uh, overstated or understated? Understated. Yep. So the projected misstatement will be 20,000. And we're saying this is understated because the, um, you know, they're saying that it's only worth 480 or 380, excuse me. And we came up with 400,000, so this is an understatement. Our ratio estimation is, um, I, I think it's probably one of the more, it, it, it's, it's probably the, the most universal of all, yeah, it's not me. It's probably the most universal of all of the uh, methods because it, it basically says that large things will be up by large amounts, small things off by small amounts, which is kind of intuitively, you know, uh, would be, be probably be most populations and stuff. You know, a $50 account isn't going to be up by $5,000, but, you know, a, a $400,000 account could be, you know, so. You know, it, it does kind of make more uh, common sense that that would be kind of the way things are. So the ratio estimation is that uh, there's a ratio. There's a uh, between the items that big things are off by big amounts, small things are off by small amounts. So the audit average divided by $50. Uh, divided by the book average.
times uh, the book the, the total book value, the accounts receivable book value. Uh, maybe, I maybe say the total book value would be a better way to put it. And this will equal our projected value. Um, three ninety five eight thirty three. You want to check that? That's what I got. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, so this would be our wait. And our projected misstatement would be fifteen eight three three something. Uh, Overstated or understated? Oh, what am I doing here? Hold on a second. <laughs> okay, this, that's not the projected value. Let me try this again. This is the projected value. Uh, this would also be understated, right? We're saying it should be 395. They only have 380 on the books, so that should also be understated. Difference estimation is a weird one because it um, because you you find the uh, misstatement first. So because you find the misstatement first, then you kind of back into the uh, projected misstatement. So it's a little bit um, a different to use. Now it also. It's it kind of goes just the opposite idea behind ratio estimation. And this one is saying that everything will be off by exactly the same amount, you know, regardless of how, what size it is. So something that a $50 account will be off by the same as a $5,000 account. Okay. So we get a difference. And the difference is $2. And what we're going to say is that um, everything up here, the total of 8,000. Everything will be off by that same two dollars. Doesn't matter what size the account is. Uh, all the accounts will be off by two dollars. So this would be a sixteen thousand. Misstatement. Now notice that what we're doing here though is we're saying that everything, the $2 has to be added to each of these items. So is this gonna be an overstatement or understatement? It would be an understatement. Yep. Yeah, it's understated. We're saying that everything is understated by $2. So, you know, the $16,000 misstatement, rejected misstatement, I should say.
So sixteen thousand dollar projected misstatement is and understand we're saying that look everything is two dollars too low. We have to add two dollars onto everything, regardless of the size of the item. Two dollars gets added onto it. All right, so the projected value would be uh, what is that? Three, three ninety six. That would be predicted value. And so again, you know what? And the whole idea behind this is you, the whole idea is that uh, you take a sample and you project it over the population as a whole, and that will tell you what what you know, the likely misstatement is here. This one's a little bit awkward just because it's, uh, he used the projected misstatement first. All right, question on that? Okay, let's go to monetary unit sampling, the wacky one. And monetary unit sampling is wacky. It's only for overstatements and generally only if there will be a, a, a very few errors in the sample. If there's, if there's a lot of errors, uh, it has a problem with that. But it's also only for overstatements. It doesn't look for understatements. And if it finds understatements, it, it ignores them because it's not supposed to find those. So it's only for overstatements. Now. If you do have something that you're looking at for overstatements, it's very good because, like we talked about before, if you know you, you work out what the interval is, and if it goes, if any item goes over that interval, it's more likely to be or it will absolutely be picked. But the more uh, management um, overstates something, the more likely it's going to be caught, which is great. You know, the more that they do it, the more it's going to be caught which is not necessarily the case in classical sample. Okay. So population of book value, so the book value app is 500,000. Tolerable misstatement is The expected misstatement is 1,200. I want. I, th I think the last time that this was on the uh, CBA exam, they didn't have an expected misstatement. Uh, I believe it was on there uh, somewhat recently, but they didn't have an expected misstatement. So if this is zero, notice you don't have to do the expansion factor. Right? I mean, if it's zero times anything is going to be zero. So if there is no expected misstatement, which using this method, that, that very well could be, um, you're not going to have this part of the equation down here because if the expected misstatement is zero, it doesn't matter what the expansion factor is. Okay, but now we have to get the reliability factor for zero overstatements. So we come down here. What was the... Okay, so what's the reliability factor we're going to use? Two point three one. Uh, yep. We're at zero percent. 
2.3. And the expansion factor. One point five. So uh, when you're doing this, when you, when you get on the test, make sure you look at this, whatever it is up here, because this this will change. You know, it, it can change what it is. Okay, so this would work out too. Uh, I should make extra space in here for this. Ooh, don't do that, Mark. Space here. We should be together. <laughs> okay. I know I'll do it up, I'll do it up here. There we go. Easy. Okay, so five hundred thousand times two point two one. Divided by Uh, thirty thousand. Too much. Thirty thousand. Minus one point five times twelve hundred is eighteen hundred. Forty nine point nine five or say forty one. We'll pick forty one items. Oops. And then down here, the total book value is 500,000 divided by 41. Equals. Some number. Twelve thousand one ninety five. But you probably just round that off to the nearest dollar. I would say you can leave, you can leave the dollar, the cents on there if you want. It won't hurt anything. There we go. 
Okay, good question on that one. And the beauty of this one is that not only does it tell you the sample size, but it also picks the sample for you. you know, everything that crosses that interval of 12,195. 12, so everything that crosses that interval of 12,195, that's what I'm doing you pick. So it picks the sample for you and it automatically stratifies it. Larger items are more likely to cross that threshold. And if there is an item that's bigger than 12,195, it's 100% certain it'll be picked. So if management you know, boosts up an account by $20,000, if you're doing classical sampling, you may or may not pick that item, right? Because if, you do, if you're doing a random sample, it may, you may or may not pick it. For monetary unit sampling, if they put a $20,000 fictitious uh, sale on there or whatever, you're 100% sure, certain you're going to pick it because it's more than the interval. So there is a kind of a, it, it it's can only be used for overstatements, but it's really good at overstatements. Okay. This is kind of a comprehensive one. And uh, this one similar to this, to this has been on the CPA exam several times. Okay, so let's go through these first items. Let's take the first one first, how about? What is the predicted misstatement for the first one? is a little bit of a trick question. Give you another hint. This method isn't supposed to find these. An understatement? Yep. This is an understatement. Notice that this is. This is an understatement. Uh, we're not supposed to find these. When we do find them, we ignore them. So this is not a misstatement at all. And I know as, <laughs> as, a, uh, oops, as, a, as an auditor, oops, <laughs> it's not right now what I'm doing here. Um, you know, you come across a misstate, you kind of come across something like this and say, okay, it, it, you know, it, it, it's a misstatement, but you just ignore it, <laughs> which, yeah. Why is it a mis why is it an understatement? Because we say it's worth 300, they only have it on the books at 250. Oh, I see. Yeah, so if this, if the audit value is greater than you know, if this is greater than the book value, then uh, we ignore it. Gotcha. Yeah. And then and it is a weird one because, I mean, you know, you know, when you're doing through auditing, if you, when you come across something that's wrong, you go, oh, oh, look at this, it's wrong. It's missing. But in the, for this method, it says, okay, well, you're not supposed to find those. And if you do find them, you, you throw it back. It's, there's nothing wrong with it. Okay, let's go to a more uh, standard one that we would have. 
one value is 20. I can already calculate that I should have chose a different number here. It comes out to 500. So the projected misstatement would be how much? Would it be 4,500? Yeah, and I, here's the stupid thing that, uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but it when you look at the at the next ones here, it has nothing to do with the, the following ones. I, I should have picked different numbers. This 4,500 has nothing to do with that 4,500. And this would be included in the um, incremental allowance because there could be more wrong in that interval. That interval is really only, only 200 of the 500,000 is showing as being you know, used from that interval. But that this, so there might be more in here. So this could be more in this incremental allowance. And again, this 4,500 is a, a unhappy coincidence. It has nothing to do with this 4,500. And um, it's not gonna help you guys, but I'll change that for the next class. Uh, I apologize for that. But anyway, um, yeah, so those that, that 40, those two 4500s are not, um, yeah, they are, they're, they're not related. OK, uh, so coming down here to, well, this 4500 and this, uh, this one is a special one also. What is special about this one? So what's special about the um, of this one? Book value is greater than the interval. Yep. And when that happens, what we do is we take the actual error. You know, notice that this item is larger than this, and it would be reducing the error if we were to multiply it out like we normally did like this one. And we know that this one is off by, what, 1,000? So here we would just take the actual amount. We would ignore the uh, interval. And by the way, this one is 100% sure of being picked. So if they simply added 1,000 onto this one, all that did is guarantee that it was going to get uh, found out. But we'll take the actual uh, overstatement. equals a thousand. So this is the oops, this is the actual misstatement. And you'll notice that this couldn't get any worse. This covers the entire interval of 5,000. Ooh, ooh, don't do that. Uh, this covers the entire interval of 5,000. You know, so there's nothing else could be wrong in this. So this, even though it is a misstatement, it's an overstatement, it is not going to be included in the incremental allowance. So they're only going to have one in the incremental allowance, and that's this. Now, this is the only one that's going to be in there. Now, we will count this one for finding out the uh, calculated rejected misstatement. 
So this would be 4,500 plus 1,000, wherever that is, 5,500. Oh, I, I have got to change these numbers. That's another unhappy coincidence. That is, that's almost weird how. <laughs> That this 5,500 and this 5,500 are, they're unhappy, just like me. Okay. So that's a prediction misstatement, and this is our best estimate of what it is misstated by. So our best estimate is. Um, you know, that, that this $400,000 account is off by 5,500, but we're taking a sample. So in a sample, it could be off by more. It could be off by more for two reasons. It could be off by one just because it's a sample. Samples are 100% accurate. You, unless you take 100% of the items, you're not gonna be 100% accurate. So, the, you know, you're gonna have that kind of bell curve but then also the more misstatements you have, the more likely that it's gonna be misstated by even more. Um, so there could be, there's two things that are going on here. Uh, the basic precision is, okay, even if nothing was um, misstated, it could still be off by some amount. Okay, so uh, the sampling interval is how much? Five thousand. Yeah. Uh, the reliability factor at zero is. Wait a minute. We got to find out the ten percent. Okay. Uh, let's see. We've got a couple. Let's make that green. Okay. So at ten percent. The reliability factor is two point three one. So the basic precision will be five thousand times. I'm sorry, 11,550. So if we didn't have any errors, um, this would be there anyway. So even if, there, even if this up here was zero, we would still have this basic precision. But up here, we have an account that could be off by even more. It was 4,500. And then here comes the wacky, very wacky. I'm gonna redo this for the next class too. It's gonna to make a um, incremental one. So we would take the overstatements at one. There's only one item there. So 389 minus 231 minus one. So three, eight, nine. Uh, overstatement at zero, which is this two, three, one. Minus one equals a number. One five eight. 
So that's the incremental amount that we're going to multiply by our highest misstatement by. We only have one misstatement, so that's going to be the highest one. Ten. So this will be our incremental allowance. We say, look, there could be something more wrong in that account. And I'm thinking it should be, it could be off by you another 2610. You don't need these two. Whatever all those three nineteen six sixty. So this would be our upper limit on mistakes. Ninety thousand six fifty. So our, our best estimate would be that it's off by fifty five hundred, but it could be off by as much as oops that. So when we're looking at this, we would say, okay, is this 19,660? Is this material to the 400,000? And that's going to be a judgment call. You know, if, if well, like, like close to $20,000, if, if 19,660, is that uh, material to the $400,000 account? on that. Okay, so I will send that test out after class. So let's go ahead and take a break. Oh, I went a little long here. Let's go ahead and take a break. We'll come back at uh, 7.13 and then we'll start in on um, the, uh, well, I'll leave this up for a little bit. But uh, then we'll start in on the um, accounts receivable. Um, I have a question, Professor. Yeah. How do you come up with the basic precision? I thought it was the 5,000, or is it the, I guess I thought it was the 5,000 and then times the three. Um, how do you come up with that again? Oh, good, good question. Uh, it actually, it comes down here, the um, row zero is used for liability factor for sample size for basic precision. This is at the 10% level. Gotcha. If it was at the 5% level, it would be three. Oh, I see that it was the previous problem. Okay, so, but because it's 10%, it's 2.31. Correct, correct. So it's all based on uh, this.
Yeah, and, and on the test, make sure you, you make, because uh, I, I do changes on the test. I can't remember, I, to be honest, I, I can't remember if on the test I have a 10 or 5. 10, 10 and 5 are, are the usual ones that I put on there. Mm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome.
Okay. Uh, one thing I just want to—I uh, I don't think I made clear before, and I, it, it just occurred to me. One thing you'll notice about the basic precision: the basic precision is if there's no errors, there could, it could still be off because it's a sample. And so that's kind of why, why we use this rule zero, the so number of overstatements that says, okay, if there were zero, you know, then this is the factor that we use if there were no overstatements. So that's why you take the interval by it as if there was no overstatements. Now, anything that comes above that though, is what they call incremental. It goes incrementally above this that we've already had with this 2.31. So if you're, you know, if you're wondering why we use this, Row zero, because because basic precision is the amount that would be there even if we didn't have any misstatements at all. There would still be this thing saying, okay, well, it could still be off by some because it's a sample. Okay, let me save that. And we'll start on chapter. <clears throat> Oh, we already have one of these. <laughs> Oopsie daisy. Try that again. There we go. All right. Um, so accounts receivable. <clears throat> You're probably going to why accounts receivable is a little bit um, why we are concerned, more concerned about accounts receivable than say other accounts. It's because a lot of times they're linked with sales. If you have a, um, oops, if you have a sale on credit, uh, the journal entry is going to look like this. It's going to be cash receivable, asset going up. You know, for some number, I'm just making this number up. It's not, oops. And on the other side, we're going to have uh, sales. So the debit would be So this would be the journal entry. And you know, so this would make your income statement. You know, sales, minus expenses, whatever they are. So your income. Uh, so, you know, this, you know, notice, you know, this make your income go up. So, you know, here's the temptation. If you are running a business that you want to make yourself the, the place look more profitable for whatever reason, maybe it's to get a bank loan or get a better rate on a bank loan or whatever, that you could put this accounts receivable on the books and notice that there's no cash yet. So the, you know, if the auditors come and take a look at this, they're not going to be, you know, they, they're not going to expect any cash to be there. This account C was on the books. It's on the books as an asset though. And then we have the sales. So if you want to make your assets look better, you know, we can get more assets on the books and have more sales. You can put a fictitious credit sales account, a sale on credit on your books. And that would, Give you more sales, give you more assets, um, you know. So this is one of those things that's very tempting. It, it isn't just because the accounts receivable are might be fictitious, 
but it's also a little very dangerous because this, the other side of that is going to be a sale and that's going to make your income, you know, so if this is a fictitious entry, the income would be overstated by 10,000. And you wouldn't be looking for the cash because it's accounts receivable, the cash isn't there yet. So one reason why we kind of pay more attention to accounts receivable is that it is a very tempting way for someone to overstate their sales and their income and their assets if they put a fictitious credit sale on the books. And again, the you know the, the even if the cash isn't there, which it, it <laughs> in reality it won't be because it's, it's, it's fictitious, um, that the uh, uh, account itself, you know, if, if you can count that as an asset. That it'll make the company look more secure and more profitable. So we kind of take a, um, you know, uh, we take a good look at the at the accounts receivable because of that. Okay. So let's look at some of the documents that we have um, over the uh, accounts receivable. Okay, uh, first thing is a customer purchase order. And the customer purchase order should be for um, uh, we'll have the items listed. And prices. A lot of times if, there, if this is a business account uh, that those items and listed prices, those are agreed to at the beginning of the year. And they would order those to, um, you know, throughout the year. Now, it is possible to make a sale without a customer purchase order. Sometimes those call up and say, I want this. But it, it helps as a, as a control if there is a purchase order, because you can compare that to the sales order. So this customer purchase order now is used. This is made by a customer we call a third party. Sales order is made by the client. Oops. So let's stop here for just a moment. So in the sales order will have basically the items listed and the prices will be on there too. So these, the, ideally these two will match up. Which one is a better document? The customer sale or sales order or, scratch that, uh, the customer's purchase order or the uh, client's sales order. Which one of those is better evidence? Would it be the sales order because it was made by the client? Actually, it's going to be by the third, the customer, the third party, because they're not the client. Notice that the client, you know, this sales order is made by the client. Again, running into the problem of up here, you know, they could just make a sales order for a fictitious customer. Um, you know, so you, you, the generally, the generally speaking. Um, I don't think I went into this. I don't think I talked about this before. The, the, the best evidence is comes from third parties. You know, the, the, the stuff that's made by the client themselves is generally not so good because it is made by the client themselves. You know, they made it, they have control over it. Uh, you're getting it from them. So third party stuff is usually viewed at, as better evidence uh, than uh, stuff that this, this created internally uh, for the, um, by, by the client. 
And what's the difference between a customer and a client? Because they're, I thought they are, they are synonyms. Um, this is a customer of the client, I should say. Oh, okay. Customer of. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. I, 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 uh, it didn't occur to me that that was. Let's see here. So, so, the, so for instance, if this was, uh, say, IBM, IBM has a customer. The customer sends the purchase order. They want to buy something from IBM. So, mm -hmm. IBM makes up their sales order. So, the sales order is inside IBM. And it should match up with the purchase order. Uh, you know, whatever's on the purchase order should be the same things on the sales order. That way, you know what they ordered that they, that they actually ordered those things that are on the sales order. Um, and most companies, you know, that, especially they're automated and big companies, they'll have that. You know, that will be standardized. But anyway, um, so the customer is the customer of the client. So anytime, you know, an accounts receivable are for customers of the client. And that is one of the things that we're going to, you have to test on is you'll actually contact your client's customers. I know it is funny because it, it, they're your client, but you know, it's one of their clients that you're actually looking into is because they have this accounts receivable on the books and they made the sale to a third party, someone outside the company. And that's what you're looking at. You're looking at the accounts receivable for it. So yeah, so this is the customer of the client. This is, I, I should make that more clear actually. Okay, uh, credit approval. Uh, should be done. Uh, many of the large companies will have a, uh, a department for credit approval. So credit approval should have somebody other than the sales department or accounts receivable. Um, and it, usually large companies will have their own uh, department for credit approval. By the way, this is just an aside, but um, I, uh, my father-in-law was a uh, sales rep for auto supplies, auto you know, parts and all that. And it's just funny because, you know, we have, they have all these rules for credit approval, this, that, and the other thing. And it's funny because his whole, his whole job was basically how to get around those rules. That's what, you know, they have a completely different view of rules than we do as accountants. You know, their, their view of rules is something to get around, you know. Okay, well, you know, you get a credit approval for 5000 well, Okay, well, if you, if you do this, you know, you can, you, then the, you, the soap is two accounts and then you can get 10000 of credit, you know. They still use, uh, you know, just uh, kind of wild stuff, you know, but they're, they're, you know, their view of it is very different than ours. Okay. <clears throat> um, from the sales order, we'll generate a, a pick list or a packing list. And it's possible you have both of those, a pick list and a, a packing list. And those will go along um, 
at least the packing list will go along with the um, uh, with the with the order. And this should match the sales order. or be updated for items. Oops. And this is usually what generates the, um, the, the sales uh, invoice. Uh, used to generate the um, make voltage for a second. Okay, so they should match the sales order or be updated for out of stock items. So, for instance, maybe the sales order is for 10 uh, shoes. 10 shoes, uh, we only have six shoes, so we send the six shoes, then the, the packing list or the, uh, uh, the pick list. Will be updated saying, look, we only shipped six of them. And that's what should be on the invoice, not the 10 that they ordered. So and I, I've seen in books where they say that the uh, the invoice should match the sales order. That's not true. It depends on what was shipped. So what was shipped, either the pick list or the packing slip, that should be used to generate the, uh, the sales invoice because it. Uh, yeah. Maybe because nowadays with COVID, we're more used to seeing that things are sold out a lot, um, you know. But uh, anyway, um, that should be used to generate the sales invoice. So this is what we're going to be send. This is what they should send to the customer. Says, okay, we this is what we shipped you, um, and there's an the invoice. Uh, the shipping function. This is one of the most important things in um, auditing, and. And this is, it sounds kind of funny, but it's actually a very important one. And that is the shipping point is used to verify that items were actually shipped. And the most important thing that we have is this bill of lading. This is, let's see here. Oops, I don't know what. This is very important. It's proof that items were shipped. Now, even if the items didn't necessarily get to their customer, you know, maybe they got lost in transit, uh, they, you know, they got stolen, the truck was in a crash, or whatever it is. Um, the bill of lading is very important because it shows a honest effort by the your client to ship goods to their customers. So. Even, you know, you, and you might say, well, what about the proof of delivery? Well, the proof of delivery is, is, is there's nothing wrong with it. It's good to have, and it's good to know if they, you know, when you were valuing these accounts. However, the bill of lading is a very important one because it actually shows that there was an honest effort made to sell these things, whatever they were. And we use those dates on those, you know, uh, the bill of lading as far as when the sale is actually made. So anything that was sent out, say, on December 31st, we'll have a bill of lading marked December 31st. They can count that as a sale. 
where if somebody signed out on January 1st of the next year, it's not going to be in this period. It's going to be a next year period because this bill of lading is marked. You know, they, well, can we just mark, you know, well, well, we actually made the sale in December. It depends on when it was shipped. If it was shipped, then you can count it. If it's not shipped, you can't. So the bill of lading is a very important document. Now, it's good to know what is on it. It transfers the possession of the goods to, the, to a transportation firm. It does not transfer title. So, and, and this is kind of an important one too. You know, this makes it different than say, selling something to somebody and, and they walk off with it. You, when you put it on the truck, <clears throat> you're giving them possession of something that doesn't belong to them. So a bill of lading to the shipper says, okay, here's this, you gave us these goods. We don't own them, you know, and, you know, quite honestly, we, you know, they probably don't care too much who, who owns them. Somebody does, not them. Uh, so a bill of lading says, here's the, here's the goods. The shipping company does not own them. Someone else does, either the buyer or the seller. Um, but that it's, it's acknowledgement that those, these items were, were taken, were put on this truck. And they'll have the number of goods, uh, description of goods and weights and all that kind of stuff will be on there. Uh, signed by both parties, the shipper and the carrier. Uh, seller and buyer addresses will be on there. And this is also very important, or can be important, but they really don't have the prices on. Uh, and if you think about it, the shipper is not, you know, the shipper is not liable for delivering uh, bowling balls, you know, fifty dollar bowling balls. You know, <laughs> the, the prices don't matter. They, all they know is this bowling ball. Okay, we got you know these. We're sending ten bowling balls to someone. Um, it doesn't matter what the price is. It could be $50 bowling balls, it could be $500 bowling balls, whatever they are. It, that doesn't matter. It's just those items are going to be shipped there. Now, if there's an insurance claim or something like that, that's going to be something different. But as far as the bill of lading, what was put on the truck? You know, 10 bowling balls were put on the truck. That'll be a description of them, have the weight of them, count of them, and all that kind of stuff. So they don't usually put the amounts on there on the bill of lading because the, the transportation company is not responsible for those to be $50 bowling ball. So the bill of lading is, is probably the most important one of all of these uh, because it does show honest effort and it shows that something was taken. And the shipping company, I should put this on here. Let's add a sixth one to this. Is a transportation firm, I'll use the same terms. Transportation firm is a third party. So this document is a third party document. It's signed by uh, the shipping department and the carrier. And this carrier is you know, a third party. Uh, and uh, I'm going to beat this this up, but this uh, so this bill of lading that is the most common one, and that's one that you should be using. I've seen where where uh, for auditing books and stuff they say that the company makes its own shipping documents. The bill of lading is actually a legal document that virtually everybody uses. So um, you know, an, an internal shipping document is not the same as a bill of lading. A bill of lading is a legal document that is between the carrier and who's ever shipping it and is you know it's for specific items that be uh, that are loaded on there is transferring possession but not title 
uh, to those goods. So bill of lading is, is a very important one. Now, proof of delivery is also can be important. And the proof of delivery is, as you guys I'm sure know, you know, so the day delivery and uh, usually it'll be a signed recipient or some kind of proof that it was actually dropped off. You know, nowadays they use pictures and stuff like that to show that it was put on your doorstep if they send you something from Amazon or something. But um, uh, anyway, um, those are all uh, basically the, the, the proof of delivery is more for say the valuation of the accounts rather than the um, the question of whether that sales actually existed because the sales may have existed even if the stuff was lost in transit. So there is a little bit of a distinction uh, between those two. Okay, billing function. Uh, we talked about this a little bit. Uh, the sales invoice and the packing slip should be Uh, sales invoice and the packing slip should agree. Okay, uh, collection of receivables. This is generally done by uh, terms. Oops. Um, Shipping terms, you get price all those in other classes. For instance, uh, you know, it, it could be you have discounts so you paid early. Uh, so, so it's 210 net 30. Would mean that you get a 2% discount if you pay in 10 days or you have to pay it in 30. Uh, you, you, you guys have this in your classes? I don't want to bore you. <laughs> I don't want to bore you silly, I'll put that a little late for that. but. Uh, so it should be doing so for instance, terms of 210 net 30, this would be uh, like 30. And, and generally the shipping, you know, the, the collection terms um, are often, uh, they're a compromise basically. You know, credit approval and shipping terms and all that kind of stuff. If you make them too drastic, people, um, you're, you're gonna lose your customers. Uh, on the other hand, if they're too lenient, you're not gonna get your cash. So it's a, there's always a kind of a balancing act uh, with those. So collection of the receivables is obviously an important function of it, of the company. But um, yeah, that's usually handled at a kind of a higher level uh, than the normal shipping uh, function. Okay. Um, aging trial balance and you know, what do we have here? Well, uh, some of this stuff's kind of boring. I'll, I'll push through it though. Gauging <laughs> uh, a trial balance. Uh, this is a, a trial balance that will have, oops. This is wrong. Let's just say aging accounts receivable. I'm going to change this. Aging of accounts receivable. This is based on past due. And I'll give you an example. So for instance, if you have a current uh, 
account receivable, say of one hundred thousand. Maybe an estimate of uncollectible would be one uh, percent. Now, as you start aging it, as you start going on, so let's say that there are uh, past due for up to 30 days, oops, 30 days. Uh, maybe you have, uh, let's say 20,000 of those, and it might be a little higher. Uh, well, yeah, let's say 0 0.08. So whatever that is, that's 1600. Yeah. So you think you wouldn't you wouldn't collect 1600 of those? And just to kind of round this out, let's say over 30 days. Say over, uh, say, uh, yeah, I'll say 30 days plus, 31 days plus. And maybe you have, say, 10,000 of those. Now that's gonna be higher. Let's say that that's at 20%. Um, so this would be $2,000. So this would be your estimated I should make this into a Okay, so this would be four thousand six hundred. So this is what an aging of a conscious evil would look like. Shouldn't it bounce to a hundred per uh, to a hundred percent or? Uh, no, not really. Uh, this because it, it really matters on how far these go. Uh, now, um, as far as you can do it by a percentage of what is included in it. So here's the here's the way this would look like. This is what this would look like on the um, on the balance on the uh, balance sheet. Your assets, you'd have accounts receivable. And the accounts receivable would be for 130,000, it'd be all these together. Now, this is what they owe the client, all those together. And so the accounts receivable would be 130,000. And then they'd have the, um, The uncollectible will be minus 4,600. And so what they would show this as, as the, uh, is the net. So you can see it. So this would be the uh, net. Accounts receivable. I get it. Whatever that is, 20, oh, 125,400. 
I think. Now, most companies will just show that in the books. They will show this other stuff. They'll put this in the notes. But if they were to show it, they, this is how they would show it. They say, okay, we have 100, people owe us 130,000, but we're not going to collect 4,600 of it. And so this will really be our net accounts receivable. Now, as auditors, you know, these are kind of the numbers, these percentages are what you're going to look at to see if this makes sense. You know, and they probably have this from something that happens in the past. In the past, 1% uh, would look like oh, 8%, 20%, whatever it is. And so you come up with an assessment that this uncollectible amount is, um, you know. And as, a, as auditors, though, you know, we, one of the most, one of the risky parts of auditing are estimates. Estimates are, are for auditors are risky because they can change things quite a bit. And so, you know, one thing in the accounts receivable is if they could be overstating their accounts receivable. For instance, they're not going to really collect 125,400 that they may be, you know, uh, making this out so that they, they it looks like they're going to collect you know, more than they really should. Maybe this would be 115,000 or something. So that's one of the things you always look at at auditing is, is estimates. And if you think about it, though, a lot of stuff is estimated. You know, not only do we have the accounts receivable, but you, you get into long-term assets, things like equipment, buildings, you know, those things, you know, how long are they going to last? Are they going to last for five years or 10 years? What's the residual value going to be? You know, those are, and those can be big numbers. You know, you look at, for instance, uh, depreciation of trucks at some place like UPS, you know. <laughs> yeah, they got a bazillion trucks. That's an estimate. But they, but they have done, you know, a whole bunch of trucks. And so, you know, as an auditor, when you walk into someplace like that, you, that becomes really important. The estimate of how long those trucks last is probably a pretty big one because it's probably a pretty big number. Okay. Oops. Now, one of the things you might compare the client to is the industry average. For instance, uh, let's take the average for up here. The average up here would be this, be 130,000. Uh, sorry, uh, 4,600. 4, divided by 130,000 equals. Point zero three five. Let's say point zero point zero three five. So about or 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 three and a half percent. So taking from the this up here. So what you might do is compare that amount to the industry average. Say okay, you know if the average in the industry is is five percent. And they only have three and a half percent. It's not necessarily evidence that they're doing something wrong, but if their customers are basically the same customers that the rest of the industry has, you might question whether that 3.5 percent of their you know, that, that number is actually a good number or not. So one of the things that you do to kind of get a, a reasonableness for estimates is maybe look at the industry average, taking into account that the customers might be different for your client versus the industry. Um, but uh, if the clients are, if the customers are pretty much the same, you'd expect this number to be similar to what the industry average is. So, so for instance, if this was, um, oops. Uh, 
Did I say five percent? So if the initiators is five percent and your client was only showing the three and a half percent were uh, this rate on collectible, you may question this number because this is different than the industry. And if you have the same customers, there might be a, a problem there. Okay, let's stop here. Okay, um, and maybe we'll, we'll do some of this other stuff in the next track. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, after we get a sign off here, I'm going to go ahead and send out the uh, Sampling exam, my brain's dead. The sampling exam, and uh, it'll be due on the eighth, I think. Yep. Show you here. So I'm gonna send out the sampling exam. It's gonna be very similar to the the practice exam, and it'll be due on Friday, uh, four dash eight. Questions? No. Okay. Uh, well, have a good weekend, and uh, I'll send an update exam. If you have any questions, uh, well, let me ask this: Does anyone have any questions on the other exam, the uh, chapter ten? Uh, I, I sent a correction out uh, that the one had a, had the wrong uh, ending balance for cash for the book balance. If, if you have, if 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 you're if your bank reconciliation comes off by exactly 20,000, that's because of my error. But anyway, um, okay, if you have any questions on it, you can go ahead and uh, email me or get a hold of me somehow. Okay, have a good weekend and I'll see you guys in a week's time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, have a good night. Good night.